So I too hate technology, so please bear with me and be kind. Um, I've been really moved today and I feel somewhat like the last performer on Strictly, you know, does anyone watch it? <laughs> and it's always really good. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Just before we start, sorry about that. Oh my Lord, that face, good God. Not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> so I'm going to play with this as well because I'm likely to forget to do one or two things. So, so this is my about my dad's brain and but it's kind of my story because my dad's no longer with us um yeah and just a real treat for me to be in york i, I come from derbyshire well i don't i come from Luton originally but uh, i try to avoid telling people that um but it's yeah a real treat for me to be here i've just recently come out of being a full-time carer for my mum she's still alive she's 93 but she's gone into care she was a full-time carer for my dad for 18 years post encephalitis. And that's really important for me to remember, I think. So I'm passionate about carers. And I agree with these two quotes. I think stories make us more alive, more human, more courageous and more loving. I felt a hell of a lot of love in the room today and everybody's story, I can go, kind of, oh, Chloe's still Chloe. Oh, yes, Godfrey, yes, I get that, you know. And it's, um, and I, I felt I had a moment of imposter syndrome before I came. I think my dad's story is such a long time ago that, is it still relevant? Um, it might not be, but thank you for welcoming me. I don't feel like it's too much of a, an imposter now. <coughs> Excuse me. So my bad, dad's brain story happened a very long time ago, and I hope it's okay to take you back in time a little. A time of black and white photos. I'm looking at you, Samantha, here. You might remember those and Godfrey. Yeah, the generation game and Terry Wogan. Forgive me if that means nothing to you, but there is a thing called Google, as, as Lucy said, so you might have a little look <laughs> at that. Um, and even though encephalitis is all very much now in the past for dad, mum and the family, I've long held a desire to share his story. And this opportunity gives me the chance to start this important process. I believe sharing stories is vital to our well-being. And there's something about that one. If it's in you, it has to come out. <laughs> and it might come out in all sorts of ways. It might come out in trauma ways. It might come out in memories or hazy, I think was the word you used, Godfrey, your hazy memories. So I, I describe encephalitis as an unwanted house guest. It arrived totally unannounced um, in such a dramatic and devastating way for us. One minute we were out for a family drive. I'm not sure what car we were in. I have to ask mum, see if she remembers. Mum has dementia, but she might remember that. Something very old anyway. And then dad started bumping the curb. And I remember that's a memory I have that wasn't right. And then his speech started becoming very mumbled and chaotic. Things got much worse during the day and in the middle of the night, ambulance, doctors. I do remember my mum actually, she was having to ring the doctor and ring the doctor and ring the doctor again. This isn't right. Something very bad is happening here. And she, she was a timid woman. She is a timid woman sometimes. Um, but she, yeah. Oh, God, I'm going, clicking on. Oh, see, I knew that would happen. Move, move around too much. So, so, yeah, it was all very serious, basically. And interesting for me, I can still wake now with some flashback stuff from that night in terms of trauma link stuff. And it's something I've had to work through. If I wake in the middle of the night having a panic, panic attack, I know what it's about. And it'll be about that. So I want to introduce you to my dad. Click on that and that. Oh, what I didn't, I forgot to say, that I feel that encephalitis bought into our family. It's bags, it's dirty laundry, caused a right flipping mess, really. Um, it was unpredictable, uncommunicative, and visited everyone in our family home and the dynamic in a slightly different way. It changed everything seemingly overnight. And we all had to undergo huge changes. Obviously, my dad was massive in terms of accommodating its needs. And it stayed. How rude. So yeah, so so I've done it again. Gosh, you're so sensitive this, isn't it? So my dad was Norman, was his Norman rule Albert Hughes. How posh. Uh, <laughs> he, um, he was my dad. 
he was an viral encephalitis survivor. And what I loved was that video at the beginning. I don't know if people were watching it, sort of about the encephalitis survivor thing. I thought, oh yeah, that's the last thing we relate to, isn't it? He was a fighter pilot survivor and a secondary head teacher survivor. And I'm not sure, <laughs> and I'm not actually sure out of all of those, <laughs> which was the most impressive. I remember him once telling me before he was ill, um, I hid in the toilets today <laughs> because six form were a nightmare. <laughs> so, and I'm Robin, his daughter. Um, so this, what a good looking bloke. <laughs> so this is my dad, Norman, and he was 21 years old when this was taken before encephalitis visited. This was taken in 1944 when he was shot down over Italy and taken as a prisoner of war. He was in the RAF. I've had some lovely conversations with the press man over there who's an aviation specialist, if any of you want to know anything. <laughs> and ironically, he was saved by Germans and, um, yeah, and walked across Europe once he'd recovered from his injuries because he was very badly injured, burns, etc. He walked along with others to Stalag Luft I, prisoner of war camp in Bath in Poland. And he kept a wartime log and I bought it here. This is a typed up version because the original is very delicate now. Um, and he wrote short stories. So it wasn't a sort of on Monday we did this, on Tuesday we had mashed potato, on Wednesday we'd stories. Very RAF kind of what oh, hubba hubba, let's go chocks away type of language, but they're beautiful. And I really got to do something with this, you know, in terms of storytelling for him. But we, we, we typed it up anyway. Um, yeah, and he talked about his experiences and the losses and his burns and fundamentally how he was feeling in fiction terms. And he absolutely loved to read and write um, anything. Books were his life pre encephalitis. And when he was in the prison of war camp, he spent hours listing all of these books and plays and theatre and rate, all sorts of things and i'm actually working my way through some of these books to keep connected to him because encephalitis actually didn't allow me to connect with him as i was five at the time in many ways in many ways um, in some i was able to connect with him so um, I read a quote. It's interesting because I, I treated myself to stay over last night. It's New York a lovely place. I think I might move here. I'm going to move here. And, and one of the quotes, I've been reading stuff that I bought, and one of the quotes in his log was, there's now no reason to write in secret with one eye open for German search parties. Now I can write what I please once the war had ended. So this is also my dad. Uh, this was taken in 1970 and after the war he trained to be a teacher to give something back to new generations in a hope that another war didn't occur and i think we've had some terrible news this morning that people are hurting each other in parts of the world again um and this was taken in 1970 and this was very shortly before he had encephalitis he was head teacher in a school in luton stockwood high school and he taught history and english which were both passions of his as well as hiding in the toilet that's what he did <laughs> but that was just before he was he was poorly so it was suggested that the encephalitis had lay dormant for years from his raf experience via herpes infection but we oh that's a oh that's a spoiler that was <laughs> um but we never knew whether this was the case or not the information i've got is obviously based on a five-year-old child's memory of this really and from what mum was able to tell me but i was aware that there were men in the same ward and those men were not surviving with encephalitis so i had that very much in my mind i went to visit him once we didn't go a lot it was very traumatic um, I made him a little whale that I'd made out of felt and stuffed it. Um, I have, you know, hazy memories um, and some quite distressing memories as well. So that's me in 1970 when I was five, and that was my first official school photo. Excuse the fringe, <laughs> nothing's really changed. That was my mum chopping my fringe. And it was taken shortly um, after dad was ill. I smiled a lot perhaps a little bit too much considering how hard things were at home. 
When he arrived home from hospital, a resounding memory for me is he didn't know what I was, and I think others have spoken of this, let alone who I was. So he was very anxious about this small thing running around. I do remember sitting on his lap, teaching him to count to five, because I could do that. And I was really proud that I could do that. And I was, I remember with his fingers going like this, I wanted him to show how clever I was and for him to um, remember some stuff. So he did receive some physio and speech therapy for a short time after he returned home, but that was it. Apologies to medical professionals in the audience. Um, it was limited, you know, it was really, really limited in terms of what, what he accessed. Um, no one came to the house to do stuff. No one visited. There wasn't any space for us to talk about this stuff because it was massive. We lost swathes of friends, colleagues, his career. Um, others found it a bit too hard to manage, that feeling of people walking across the road when dad was wandering off or having a seizure or doing something unusual, you know? It felt very hard. So I navigated childhood by being a very, oh, <laughs> by being a very, very good girl and helping mum and not needing very much at all from anyone ever. So note from my adult self, this isn't a healthy adaptation and only one that you can carry for so long. Um, but I found joy in the normal things, friendships, books, films, drama, that type of thing. However, when I was a young teenager, I started experiencing debilitating and confidence stripping anxiety and panic attacks. I've accessed lots of therapy from my mid twenties onwards and decided very early on, I think I decided then that I was going to work therapeutically with people. So also apologies to any medical professionals because <laughs> this, I just nicked this off the internet, but this could have been what my dad's brain looked like, but I actually think it's the wrong way around because that's the brainstem. Anyway, we won't worry about that too much. Um, he experienced extensive left side of the brain damage and was initially in a persistent vegetative state. And then he developed severe epilepsy once out of hospital. I remember that being really frightening, seeing him having seizures and not understanding what they were or what I needed to do. I took on a lot of responsibility for him in a way. It was oh, keeping an eye on, keeping an eye on. Um, his brain and his whole body and soul had experienced a massive trauma. And our family had experienced a trauma too, the T word, it was a trauma too. So his, his speech slowly improved and the doctors at the John Radcliffe Hospital, is that still a thing for neurology within this condition? I think it probably is, isn't it? I know other people have mentioned other hospitals, but they were astounded at how much functioning he relearned, um, though mum re remained his full-time carer, as I say. So he never worked again, but he did make remarkable strides in his abilities and took on the dole of, role of dog walker, potato peeler, cup of tea maker in our family. He was always there and always present. His moods would fluctuate and it was always quite difficult to know how he was going to be from one day to the next. Um, he created a daily routine that really supported his well-being with help. Um, but I'm not sure our miniature poodle would agree because she was walked for miles. <laughs> Bunny, I was allowed to call, I was allowed to name her. I named her after a rabbit. <laughs> Bunny. Yeah. Um, so he walked every day a route that he knew. He visited Luton Music Library frequently, watched endless TV and radio. And also what he did was he wrote now he wrote a diary and there's also something I need to be doing with this and I don't know what it is yet but I've got um, 16 years of these so from 1972 when he was able to uh, to put pen to paper really it took two years from his his infection and he he wrote absolutely tirelessly every single day pages and pages smells of the past um, pages and pages of of words now they weren't words about what he'd done what he'd experienced how he felt it was literally copying out the radio times or the guardian or the observer um that was 1973 so from there to here you can actually see a great improvement in terms of how much he was able to write because you know that was packed and that was only a few lines Sometimes when I look through this, he does write happy birthday, Robin, things like that. And it's like, oh, yeah, you did know that, didn't you? You know, but he um, I believe he he wasn't ever able to write stories again. Um, 
but I think he tried so hard if the, you know, to keep this going as an educator, as a teacher. He kind of knew that this was really important. Um, and that's why I'm here today, I think. Um, interesting, I was looking on October the 7th of 1984 <laughs> and Luton beat QPR 3-2. I think they've lost a day to Tottenham, but we won't talk about that anymore. So <laughs> I love football. <laughs> so, um, so this is definitely what his heart looked like. And I think, you know, others of you have sort of, you know, the person is there. The person is there. His enthusiasm for music, theatre, sport, films. My mum worked so hard at taking us to London to see all the pantomimes. And there's some trauma memory based on that as well, because the one time we all got on the tube and dad didn't. And he was standing on the station on his own. And I remember feeling responsible for that. I wasn't, mum was, you know, but I felt it. So we had to all rush back and he was just still standing there. So we found him, it was all fine. Um, he always came to every performance that I took part in and I could still see his beaming smile. I think he might even be here at some point today. Um, I knew he was and would be very proud of me. So he lived until 1988, which is also such a long time ago. And he died of a heart attack on the toilet which you are allowed to laugh at because he'd have found that really amusing you know and the germans didn't get him the italians didn't get him and Kivalites didn't get him but he died on the toilet um i think that's all those cigarettes from uh, from from the raf i think but anyway um so from this lived experience i always knew i would work therapeutically with people something that wasn't available for my dad or the members of my family and I'm really particularly interested in trauma and living with a lifelong condition because I've lived for 18 years and living well with the lifelong changing condition. Um, I work for a, a, an organization called Cavanoma Alliance, which is a neurological condition as their therapist. And I work in private practice as well. And with particular interest in kind of trauma, really, I guess. Um, yeah, and hopefully, supporting supporting people it's kind of what i think lucy was saying you know serving it's kind of like hopefully that helps someone so thank you that's all Bye.